Alright, good evening everybody. Ready to rock and roll here with the last of the CCNA topics, um, at least proceeding sequentially down. So, I did learn my lesson last week though. I tried the, the coffee thing and um, <laughs> it went cold within about the first 20 minutes of the stream. So, I've just got this bubbly, sparkling water, strawberry flavored. Keep me company tonight. Um, as far as the agenda tonight, we are looking at... Um, uh, just whatever Cisco considers infrastructure maintenance. Uh, infrastructure maintenance is just a very broad topic and it's whatever Cisco wants to throw in. It's kind of the catch-all topic um, subject. Hey, thanks for, by the way, saying hi. Mr. Liudal, I probably totally butchered that. Jake, good to see you. Looks like we've got some people streaming in here, so be sure to say hi in the chat when you come in. Let us know you're here. Um, so the three things we really want to cover tonight are going to be SNMP, uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time with SNMP, but just kind of drill into some of the things Cisco probably wants us to know and understand about it. Um, we're going to spend probably the majority of our time talking about AAA concepts, which is a security thing, but Cisco threw this into the infrastructure maintenance. Um, definitely involves just general maintenance of our network. And then last but not least, and this is going to be the fun part, um, is talking a little bit about network automation concepts. So... Again, we're not going to become experts on network automation. We don't need to become experts at network automation for the CCNA, but we definitely need to understand what some of these concepts are that we've got listed out there. So um, controllers, controller, uh, the control and data plane separation, and then northbound and southbound APIs we're going to be talking about. Jimmy DeFace, welcome. Big Papa House, good to see you again. All right. Very good. So... Um, without further ado, let's go ahead and dive in. Um, you'll be pleased to know that I put a big X over where I'm not supposed to draw, <laughs> so where my face is, because it doesn't show up on my other drawing tablet screen. So hopefully tonight I won't, you know, draw and then like go right into that area without realizing it. So um, baby steps, we're we're learning. So um, talk about SNMP first. So SNMP is the um, uh, j just a management protocol. I think we've all probably at least interfaced with it a little bit at this point. Um, it's interesting because SNMP was really designed to go out, simple network management protocol, designed to go out and manage network devices for us and primarily in a read-only capacity. Um, SNMP uses these concepts called OIDs, um, object identifier, I think, but I don't, don't, don't quote me on that. Go look it up. Um, and the idea is this, we're, we're going to have an SNMP, uh, server and an SNMP client. Oops. I went to draw that differently. It's a router, right? An SNMP client. And we're going to, in some way, interact back and forth with this device in the same way that today we use SSH and Telnet when I say today, I just mean like our, our main ways, our main methodology of configuring um, a router would be to the these tel terminal instances, right? Just getting on there and doing a config T and such. Um, but the SN what SNMP allows us to do is to get information and push information via our, you know, a different, basically a different protocol. It's, it's designed around automation. Um, is <laughs> called the early version of network automation, but SNMP was found to have a lot of limitations, which is why we've gone the direction of NetConf, RESTConf, REST APIs, and such, which again, we'll be talking about here in a little bit. Um, as far as SNMP is concerned, there, there are a few things we need to know and understand. First of all, this concept again of OIDs. These OIDs are long strings of numbers <laughs> that define uh, for a specific vendor how to do something. So if you look at Cisco, we have this inf management information base, or MIB, that consists of a lot of these OIDs. And we can explore like, hey, how could I configure a, you know, maybe I'm making my own man network management platform, um, a SolarWinds. If you've used SolarWinds before, what's up gold? any of these network management software packages that I can use to manage network devices, the, the, the developers who are making those have to drill into these, these OIDs and these, um, the, the MIBs and the tree, the management information trees. 
all of this has to be managed by them. Fortunately, you and I, we don't have to worry too much about it. Um, but other than just the concepts. And so they need to understand what, you know, OID would be leveraged in order to obtain the show run, for example. Um, and that's going to allow us to, again, manage this remote router, this remote device, whatever the network device is that's running SNMP. So again, we don't really need to worry too much about this from a configuration perspective, especially at the CCNA level. Uh, the big thing that we need to worry about is going to be um, configuration of SNMP. And we need to primarily understand that there are two different flavors of SNMP. We have SNMP version 2C. Um, I don't know, I've never looked up to see what happened to version 2A and 2B, but <laughs> something happened to them. Um, probably just little additions to, uh, to maybe patch some things that were in the original version 2 specification. And then we do have version 3. Version 2, the biggest difference between versions 2 and 3 is security. Version 2C supports something that we call, hey, thanks for confirming, Jake, it is object identifier. Version 2C, I um, uh, lost my train of thought. Version 2C uses this concept of a community string. The community string is, for all intents and purposes, a, a password in plain text. Okay, the community string, I'll just go and write that out. Community string. The community string was not developed with security in mind. This was more of a prevent mistakes, you know, like, hey, I don't, I didn't mean to um, connect to this router and to make those changes. So I'm going to use a different community string on the different devices. So it equates to a password, but it's sent in clear text and it's not the most secure way of communicating. So we do protect it and I highly recommend if you're running SNMP V2C um, or V, yeah, V2C, I did say that right. Make sure that you do have a complex security, a complex community string. But ideally we're moving to version three. Version three has been out for years and years and years. Um, and I still see mostly version 2C when I look at other people's networks, it's kind of weird. Uh, Big Papa House, from what I understand, version two took out the community part the industry wasn't happy, so 2C, a community, was tried it out. I have never heard that before. That's a fun story if that's the case. Um, if C stands for community and they added the community string back in. But version 3, the good news with version 3 is we get two different forms of uh, security in this. We get authentication and we get encryption. The difference, and we need to all understand this, the difference between authentication and encryption. Authentication is this concept of like username and password. It's defining who are you? Who am I? The way I prove that I am Jeff Kish when I'm logging into something is usually by saying, okay, my username, Jeff Kish, J Kish, whatever username I have, and then entering my password. My password is supposed to prove that I am who I say I am. As we know in this day and age, hey, passwords are a dime a dozen on the, the, the dark web. And so it's really easy for somebody else to grab my password. And so we have better ways of doing authentication. For example, two-factor authentication. If I log into an account from, you know, I don't know, Brazil, which, you know, hey, Jeff, you were just logging into your account from, from the United States. And, you know, that was yesterday, but today you're logging in from Brazil. That seems a little weird. Um, you know, hey, maybe they'll pick up on that. But either way, even if they don't, and I say they, I mean, like, I'm thinking Gmail and web services and such. Um, some sophisticated systems will pick up on that. But hey, you know, two-factor authentication says anytime I log in from a new device, they're going to send me a text message on my phone to confirm that it is me. So most services these days offer two-factor authentication, sometimes abbreviated as TFA or 2FA. So pay attention to that if that's a checkbox. Again, I know like a lot of the mail clients out there today support that. All right, Mr. Luda, Luda I, I'm, I'm sorry for butchering your name. Ludal, if anybody hasn't ever set it up before, you could think of it as two-step authentication. Absolutely, yeah. Um, it, it just requires two steps. I have to enter my username and my password. That's step one or factor one. And then the second factor, the second step would be something else. Um, most of the time, it's a text to your phone. Um, you could actually have it call you. You could have an email sent out. I mean, there's all kinds of different ways you can do two-factor authentication. But again, 
I digress a little bit there, but authentication is about proving who I am. Encryption, this concept of encryption, most of us are probably at least a little bit familiar with encryption. The idea is simply, I'm not going to send my password in plain text, it's called, which is literally like, if I open up a packet sniffer, I can see the password being sent um, inside the packet. Um, that's no go. That's no good. <laughs> uh, if, if I can just log in and see your password in the packet that you're sending, that's that's not good. And even beyond the password, if every if every bit of information you're sending is in plain text, and I can see everything you're sending. So if this router, for example, is sending um, the server a show run output, and I'm a bad guy and I'm sniffing this traffic, I'm the bad guy here. I'm I'm sniffing this traffic here. I can read that show run because it's not encrypted. The only way I can decrypt is if I have the key and the only one with the key is the server. So we'll have the capability of decrypting the data here on the left. So it's scrambled. It's just a completely scrambled message as far as the bad guy is concerned. This doesn't make any sense, but the server is able to decrypt it and read the information. So encryption is good from the perspective of just keeping your sensitive information secret. All right. Um, let's see here next. Yeah. So that's, that's primarily it. Uh, I will say that the configuration of SNMP v3 Cisco doesn't do us a lot of favors. I love Nexus switches because SNMP v3 is very straightforward. We, we simply have SNMP usernames and passwords. <laughs> and, um, and, and when you're doing that, you encrypt it or you don't encrypt it. It's, it's very simple on Nexus switches. iOS, we have this concept of views. Um, we have to specify whether, you know, the, 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 the users are part of views, et cetera. It seems a little counterintuitive, but at the end of the day, it really is just about configuring a username and password. That's the authentication piece and enabling encryption. Uh, that's it. And so that's what's happening under the hood. And that is primarily what I wanted to cover with SNMP. Um, actually, there's one other thing I do want to um, mention. So big Papa House views, groups, users. Yes, uh -huh, the whole the whole nine yards. <laughs> um, it's unfortunate that. Uh, oh, and I see. Yeah, I appreciate you butchering the name <laughs> emoji. Um, but oh, you're saying I got Mr. Ludal, Ludal, Ludal. I'm gonna go with Ludal. Um, the other thing that we need to consider is this concept of SNMP traps. An SNMP trap is a way of triggering a log message that will usually get sent out to a server or something along those lines. So there are certain situations, certain configuration parameters where you can configure, hey, if this happens, it's called a trap for a reason. It's like you've sprung a trap. <laughs> um, once this happens, I want you to send an SNMP message that, hey, you know, it might end up buzzing my phone. Okay, that's again, usually the role and responsibility of the SolarWinds server or the WhatsApp Gold or whatever your network management system is, is when it gets that in, then it will, um, it, it, can, it can respond in kind. Maybe it's sending an email, maybe it's sending a text message, maybe it's just logging it to its log, whatever you want it to do. A trap versus inform. So a, boy, I'm stretching now because I haven't looked that up in a while. As I recall, um, an inform is actually better than a trap. And I'm trying to remember why that is. Um, what does an inform do that a trap does not? There is something there. Uh, let's see here. SNMP. Let's just look it up real quick. SNMP inform versus trap. Um, it's just an acknowledgement. So it actually sends an acknowledgement back. That's okay. That's, that's what I was kind of leaning towards, but it doesn't really seem like that's super useful in a lot of cases. So, but, uh, but yeah, pay attention to that. Um, there is this concept of an SNMP in form and at least according to 15 second Google research, that's what, that's what is in the back of my head as well. That an inform will actually acknowledge uh, send an acknowledgement back from the server that the um, the trap was received. There we go. All right. So SNMP, um, any questions? Go ahead and chime in on the chat. Otherwise, we're going to move on to AAA. 
And again, AAA is going to be a bit of a longer conversation. Oops. There we go. Okay. So let's talk about. Let's see here. I see uh, stubbed, stubbed toe, stubbed toe. Oh, okay. Now, is your name normally stubbed toe, and you abbreviate it like that because of LSU? So congratulations to any LSU fans out there, by the way. Um, <laughs> that game went so late, but my goodness, they earned that. Um, they earned that. NCAA football college championship last night. That's for sure. Um, okay. So we're going to talk about triple a, this concept of triple a, what does triple a stand for? It stands for authentication, authorization, and accounting. I'll write that out here because we need to know that. So authentication, which we actually just talked quite at length about, which is good. So we'll come back to that in a little for a little bit authorization and accounting. Now, if I were to guess, most of us here have experience primarily around authentication. Uh, AAA is often thought of as just the way that Cisco has us configure usernames and passwords on router and device, router, router, routing, router switch devices. Yeah, tongue tied. All right. Good moment to take a drink. So, um, yes, that's true, but there are actually two other elements to AAA that is worth mentioning. So, Again, not to gloss over authentication. This is the concept of who am I? I need it's it's all about proving identity. And Cisco has gotten very sophisticated with this with their ICE um, identity services engine. Is that right? ICE ISE. Um, their ICE platform is all about this authentication concept because it takes it beyond. It, it's everything we just talked about. Cisco's ICE for an organization can actually look at trends and say, you know, Jeff, you don't usually log in at midnight um, from Iran. So um, we're thinking that this is weird. Whereas without that level of intelligence, if anybody in the world has my password, they can claim to be me. You know, it doesn't take much to log into my email normally if they have my email address and they have my password. Now, again, a lot of the email servers out there have gotten very sophisticated with detecting those kinds of things as well. But now we apply that to like a VPN. So now my users in my organization, they're VPN, maybe I have users around the world. So how do I know that somebody is logging in and that's that's weird that they're logging in from that location or what have you? Well, that's what Cisco ICE can really help with. Um, However, in our case, within the world of AAA, we, we do still tend to stick to usernames and passwords. And when we do a configuration example later, we're going to see that. Um, toe, I drop things on my feet off. And hey, well, you know what? You've got, a, you've got a good name for it, I suppose. All right. And thanks, Jake, for chiming in with all of the uh, answering some of those OID questions. So authentication, who am I? Authorization. This concept is so important. We don't want to gloss over this, okay? This is what am I doing? Uh, well, I shouldn't even, no, no, I, I shouldn't say that. It's what am I allowed to do? What am I doing is, is accounting. I jumped ahead. What am I allowed to do? Okay, this is permissions. So if you just gave me a username and password into your network, you're like, here, Jeff, you, maybe I'm, I'm a consultant. And you're like, here, Jeff, go ahead and Here's your username and password, log in and help me fix my problems or what have you. Well, that's great and all. You gave me a, a username and password. That's a th authentication. If you do nothing else, what do I have access to? Did you just give me, maybe your switch was having problems on, on the edge and you wanted me to look at the span tree configuration, but do I also have access to your core switches? Do I now, can I get onto your core switches and do a config T? Can I, can I do a config T and then do a no IP routing command on your core switch? Um, that's not a fun situation. <laughs> uh, you don't, you don't want to disable routing on your core. So what am I allowed to do? This is this authorization concept. What am I authorized to do? And by default, I should not be authorized to do anything. I, it should be permissions based. So it should be Jeff, you have author authority to access these devices. And when you're on those devices, you should only be able to do these things. So this concept of authorization is a lot of times skipped in organizations. So if you want to make sure um, that your organization is well protected, you, you might want to take a look at this and find out, are we doing authorization 
on our on our users. Um, so that's a that's a big deal. All right, so that's that concept. Big Pop House says, "What can I do?" That's a good. That's maybe a better, maybe definitely a briefer way of saying that. What am I allowed to do versus what can I do? Same thing. The last one is what I said earlier: is what did I do? So, or maybe even to say, what am I doing? So uh, that makes it sound like I don't know what I'm doing, but eh, we'll just stick with it. So accounting is simply logging what I'm doing, and yes, this is good for you know tracking maybe malicious or disgruntled employees, I suppose. But nine times out of 10, the best part about this is when, you know, I'm just humming along and I'm doing commands and all of a sudden I lose access to the network or maybe my putty crashes or whatever happens. And all of a sudden I have no idea what I did and I have no idea how to fix it. Well, accounting, the concept of this is every command that I enter, maybe I get onto a device and I do a config T and then I do an interface gig zero slash one, and then I do a shutdown and boom, I lose access. And in my panic, maybe I close my putty window or maybe it scrolls back too far and I lose it or what have you. I can go back and look and it's like, what did, what happened? You know, oh, I shut down interface gig zero one. I meant I was supposed to shut down gig zero slash 10 or something like that. So I fat fingered it. Um, you know, accounting as obviously it, it is good in those disgruntled employee situations where, you know, hey, maybe somebody did something malicious, but um, a lot, you know, the day-to-day the -day realistic situation is simply auditing, making sure that we're doing the right things um, and just finding out what you're, what, hey, what are you doing out there? You know, um, if you do have some question about what somebody's doing, you can use it. So the idea here is that the router is going to send that accounting information to usually a logging server, a syslog server, and then it'll be stored there in a text file and it'll show exactly every single command that a user entered. So accounting, what what have I done? Yeah, we've. I don't know how many of you have been there when you enter something and hit enter and it's that moment that you hit enter and you're like, oh man, what, what have I just done? <laughs> what did I just do? This is when you do ask, what am I doing? So. Anyways, so let's see here. Would so, Mr. Ludal, would would AAA be configured on a switch, a router, a server, an end user, all around? So, <clears throat> it is it is all absolutely all around. Now, from a CCNA perspective, we're only concerned with all of the networking devices. So, switches, routers, um, yeah, and, end users. I mean, there's no real way to like end users are part of this paradigm but they're they're kind of an entity within this framework versus I'm going to enable AAA on my router. I'm going to enable AAA on my server. Um, servers certain, certainly have all of this as well, but it's going to be different the way a server, like a Microsoft Windows server, for example, um, handles this versus a, um, a Cisco router, as we can imagine. So um, that is that is the bulk of what we're going to care about. Now, unfortunately, I don't have um, I don't I don't have a triple A server available tonight, so I can't really like do some of like we can do authentication because I can log into the router, so we'll do some configuration around authentication. But you're going to need to study authorization and accounting configuration as well. Um, authorization can get a little tricky. Here's the good news from the CCNA perspective. Um, what Cisco wants us to know is how to configure this on a router. Okay, the, the most complicated configuration isn't actually on the router, it's on the AAA server. So we gotta still talk about that. So let me do that here. Because we actually, believe it or not, we still have more to cover from a AAA perspective. Um, Big Papa House, the user is authenticated, which grants certain permissions and their actions are logged. Yes. That's 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 AAA in a nutshell, right? So they're authenticated, grants permission is account or is authorization, and their actions are logged is accounting. So very good. Okay, so what happens? Well, how does AAA work? Well, when I log in as a user, I'm going to try to access this router, and this router has some AAA commands. Literally, AAA is the command. Um, so AAA, and then some series of of things. So usually, well, let's just talk about authentication first. So the command would be AAA authentication. 
And then usually the, the word after this is login. We can take a look at our options later, but a lot of our authentication options are around the login process, right? And then we can either create a custom name, like a lit, like a basically a policy that we'd apply to specific interfaces, or I can affect the default policy and that will affect all interfaces. So it'll affect my VTY interfaces. It'll affect my, tel um, well, those are VTY, uh, potentially even console, et cetera. So um, AAA authentication login default is going to apply this across the board. Again, usually this is how it's configured. So this is a long command because we're still not done. What we need to specify next is my method. How am I wanting to authenticate this user? We have a lot of different options, like a lot of options. We're gonna have to go through all of them here to discuss it. But let's talk about that server concept first. Okay, usually what we want, what, what the recommendation is from the industry is to use a AAA server. That means that somewhere on the network is a server that is running one of two protocols usually. We either Radius, which is an industry open standard, okay, Radius, um, or Cisco's version of a login authentication process, which is called TACX Plus, okay? Those both do have acronyms, but um, yeah, they're remote authentication dial-in user something. <laughs> TACX, I've never memorized them. I've never had to. I don't think Cisco will ever ask that on the CCNA, um, which is fortunate. But hey, you know what? You want to go... Um, log in and, uh, or sorry, you want to go memorize what they stand for, then you'll be good to go just in case. Um, Big Papa House, would AAA new model be necessary first? Yes, we will do that in the configuration section next. We do, before we configure, before we even can configure anything AAA, we have to enable it. And it's weird because say, okay, yes, AAA new model is a command. Why do we have to enter that? Well, it actually disables some older configurations um, and we'll see that in action as well. Like the, the normal line password and such goes away when you have a AAA new model. And the interesting thing is if you try to say no AAA new model, it'll accept it, but Cisco flat out says this isn't supported. Like it's not designed to be enabled and then disabled. <laughs> Bec and then part of that is because it's truly like having to turn on services that you know had been disabled. So Cisco just didn't do any QA testing around disabling AAA new model. So make sure that you are ready to switch over to it. This is not something to play with on a live router. Uh, Mr. Leodal, would it be done in the global config? Yes, this is global configuration. Again, we'll see We'll see the details. I, I know I'm writing all of the commands out on this Blackboard, but um, we'll see all of the, the nitty gritty of it here in a little bit. Okay, so let's get back to this explanation. So we have a Radius or TACX server, and this is going to store the database of pretty much everything. Okay, this can do username and password. This can do authorization. So it can do permissions basically. Um, and it can it can be an accounting server as well, I believe. I've never, I don't know if I've ever, um, usually we drop accounting off into a, um, a logging server, but yeah, you can, you can definitely store your logs on wherever you want. So um, as far as this radius server is concerned, um, it's going to be the decision maker, basically. The router is no longer going to make the decision as to whether a user is allowed to log into it or not. So what's going to happen here is I provide a username and password, and this router is, whoops, this router is going to send that username and password to the radius server, and or TACX server, I keep saying radius, but that's just because I don't wanna say both of them. And then the TACX server, now I've said that one, is triple <laughs> A server, let's call it that. The triple A server is going to respond with yes or no, one of the two. And if it is a yes, then of course the router is going to allow that user to log in. And if it's a no, then the router is going to reject that. So that's the gist of how a authentication server works. And we can usually deploy these redundantly. So we, because, you know, for the most part, we don't want those to go down. Otherwise, people can't log in with their usernames and passwords. Fortunately, we do have a backup plan, and we'll talk about that here in a moment, uh, just in case those servers go down. Um, but it is worth talking about here because Cisco allows us to list multiple methods. 
okay? So we could say like method one and then method two and then method three. Let's say we list three separate methods. Again, we've got to go through what some of these options are. But let's say method one, this was a radius server. And I go and I check in the radius server answers with a, a no. It says, nope, you can't get in, okay? If I receive, this is important. Cisco will ask something like this on the CCNA or on a Cisco exam at some point. Um, when a radius server says no, let's say I get a no response here. This is like, you know, remember how an access list, we talked about access list. If I get a no on a line, like it's a deny, I don't go and check to see if I get a lot, right? That, that applies and I'm done. I don't look at the rest of the access list. This is the exact same concept. If I get a no, like no, that was a bad username and password. I don't check method two and I don't check method three. I simply refuse connection to that um, to the user trying to log in. The only time I use these other methods is what happens if I send a request out to the radius server and I never get a response. That radius server is down. There's a problem with the network. Like I mean, a lot of times the network is down. Like this could be a WAN, like a branch site. And this router is has lost its uplink to the rest of the network. So of course it can't reach the radius server that's probably in the data center somewhere. So because of that, we need the ability to log in. And so our second method might be using a local database. What is that local database? Well, that is simply the router saying a username and password. Well, let's do the full command here. Bring it down here so it's out of the way. Using the username command. So I'd say username, Jeff, whatever you want. Actually, real realistically, you're gonna make this some kind of like um, admin account, admin knock or or whatever. Some some kind of username that you know we're only going to use in an emergency. So there's my username. I could use the word password. Does anybody remember the issue with that one? So the word password is really not the right word we want to use in the Cisco configuration. There's a better word. And if you think about enable, I know when I first started learning about passwords, the first way I learned for enable is to use, oh, enable secret. Everybody's talking about enable secret, even in 2005 when I first started doing this. Um, but once upon a time, there was this enable password. So there we go. I see Panda, I see Big Papa. You guys got it. Secret chiming in. Um, enable secret will encrypt the password inside the configuration. Enable password does not do that. Well, because, or not because, but just in the same way as enable the username command, that is the exact same thing. So we don't actually want to say username password, even though I will tell you what, the vast majority of people understand enable secret, right? I, you don't even use enable password. No, half the people today don't even know that that's a command that you can do. But even though I see a lot of enable secrets, I see way more usernames and passwords than I see usernames with secrets tied to them. So this is absolutely something you need to know. Username, whatever the username is, and then the word secret, and then whatever that password is. This, this could be as unsecure as you want. One, two, three, four, five. I'm just joking, don't actually make it insecure. But <laughs> um, once we have that username and password, this is part of the local database. Now, of course, I can make as many usernames and passwords as I want, or usernames and secrets, I guess I should say. So I could have a username, Jeff, secret, um, I don't know, Jeff rocks with an X, so nobody can guess it. Um, so I might, I've got multiple usernames uh, within this database. So if I say local as my second method, that would be the backup for if the first method fails. So if I reach out to the radius server and it's not available, I don't get a response back, the network's down, whatever the situation is, now the router will check method number two and maybe I've got local as an option, okay? Um, once I've got local as an option, it really can't fail. I mean, there's, I don't even know what situation would cause, I don't know if there's, if there are no usernames and passwords, I've never tried that to see if that would cause a failure or if that would cause a rejection. I suspect that would cause a rejection. Um, I don't think the local database can fail. Service password encryption. All right, so 
Service password encryption is the magic word. Remind me later, by the way, because um, we can absolutely take a look at that. If I, so literally, uh, you know what? Let's just do this real quick. Calling an audible here. Let's do router, router one. All right. So if I say on this router, y'all can see this, right? All right. Um, let's just say username, admin, password, admin. Okay. And I look at the show run for this. Just gonna think about it. All right. So check this out. Username admin password zero admin. I didn't enter the zero. It just assumed that. What the zero means is that it's in clear text, which it is. It didn't scramble this at all. So if anybody, if I pasted my router configuration, I see people do this. Just be very careful with this. Going out to a Cisco forum and saying, here's my router configuration. Why, why isn't this working? And this is right there in the middle of it. <laughs> Whoops. Oh, that was just on my end. <laughs> okay, good. I just um, closed the window by accident. So, and they see, um, they, they see that, that now they know my username and password. So originally before Cisco had the secret concept, they had this great idea of like, okay, well let's do service password encryption. In fact, if I scroll back up, you'll see at the very top, it says no service password encryption. I don't know why that, that used to be the, the default. I believe the default now is service password encryption. So that's good. But let's go ahead and enable that. Let's see what happens. Service password encryption, hit enter. Do show run. In fact, I'm just going to do the pipe include username. That should just give the one line we care about. And there we go. Now this has been encrypted. So can you and I look at that and know that the password is admin? No, we, we can't know that. Here's the bad news though. This is really weak encryption, like really, really weak. Um, I don't think I've got a great way of sharing my screen here. So go Google um, type seven encryption. If you just Google search type seven encryption, you'll like top link will probably be a decryptor. So I can, I know you can't see this, but if I take this and I go and I say, let's see here, just type seven uh, decrypt. And there's right at the top, ibeast.com. I've actually used ibeast little uh, decryptor a lot. And I paste that in, I hit submit. <clears throat> it says your password is admin. <laughs> okay, that was easy. So that's why this is uh, still no good. We don't wanna rely on this. Uh, it uses very, very weak encryption. So what I really wanna do is say, um, no username admin, let's just get rid of it. Username admin secret admin. Ooh, secret admin, I like that. Do show run include username or just user in this case. All right, so another scrambled message. This is longer, it's got some symbols in there. That's cool. I mean. To me, this is no different, right? I mean, this this is a scrambled password. This is a scrambled password, but computers can decrypt this like that. So the secret, there is no easy way to reverse this. To my knowledge, there is no way. So when we talk about this type five encryption, that's what this is, is it's a much more secure way of storing information. So again, when I type in, if I wanna do enable, I wanna make an enable secret, but if I hit question mark, I can still make enable passwords. That is still an option within Cisco devices. So we don't do it. We know to use enable secrets, but again, when you're making a local username, absolutely still use um, enable secret. <clears throat> all right, so hopefully that all made sense. That was a good, a good demo, let's see here. So Big Papa, you say it would hash them so they wouldn't show as clear text in the config. Yes, that's what service password encrypt. Um, why is it weaker than secret at flat out? It's just using a weaker encryption algorithm. Um, yeah, Mr. Lodal, something to do with the MD5 hash. Um, it's, <clears throat> it's not using an MD5 hash, I don't believe. Um, I'd have to look into that. I don't know what it's using underneath the hood for that. Um, would it make sense to use secret and password encryption? You should have, um, password encrypt, like service password encryption. You should have that enabled, but ideally it's not doing anything because it'll only do something if you have an actual like password, uh, configured. But yes, best practice, you should have it. You all agree. Um, Panda agrees, so very good. 
Um, the secret uses the SHA-256. All right, y'all are asking good questions here. Um, Cisco type five password. Let's see if it says what it is. There's a lot of people asking if there are um, type fives. I don't know what it does underneath the hood to um, to do that if it's truly an MD5. Um, let's just do algorithm. There are new, there's this like a type eight out there as well. Oh, type five. Okay. According to this, it's using a very simple MD5 hashing algorithm. Okay. So there you go. Type five is MD5. It is doing that. Good question and good conversation, guys. So thank you very much. Let me know. Um, let's figure, let's go back to this. There we go. All right. Very good. Um, yeah, so it's using MD5, not not SHA-256. So let's just uh, keep that in mind. All right, so what are some of these other methods? Um, from here, there's not a whole lot of interesting methods. One of the most interesting, I suppose, that's left is simply none. You can literally tell it none, and you'd think, oh, okay, so don't let them in, right? Don't do authentication. Um, it goes the other way. <laughs> this is permit any any at the end. So if we add none as our method in any, and it gets to none, it'll simply let you in. So you could technically do none as your second method. And if radius fails, it'll just let people in. Definitely not advised, but certainly something you could do, at least in a lab environment. I still see some questions coming in. So um, zero is three, clear text. Five is the strongest encryption. And seven is weak encryption. You got it, Mr. Lidall. All right. <clears throat> um, what are some other options that we have? Um, we do have, well, I don't need to write method out for all of these. So um, we do have another method that would be, this is an interesting one, local case. So now I can make the username be case sensitive. I don't, I don't know why we have that option, but um, okay. So if I just do local as my option, then I have to type, I can type admin with a capital A admin knock, I guess, given the example, or Jeff could, I could do capital J with Jeff and it would accept me. But if I do local case, I have to enter my username case sensitive. So I guess go ahead and do that. Or maybe not. I, I, I don't know. I, I, there's no real best practice around that. I don't think. Um, and the last one that we should be aware of is line. So you can still put a password on your lines, like line VTY zero to four, zero to 15 or any of those. So we'll do that here in a little bit and take a look at it. But <clears throat> um, that way, if I try to connect via SSH, it'll ask me for that line password instead of any of the local ones. So I, I mean, my recommendation, usually what I like to see is number one method being a radius server or a group. We still need to talk about groups, that's a reminder. Um, and, and then second of all, the backup for that should just be the local database. If you want to use local case, that's fine. Um, local or local case. Last thing to be aware of is this concept of a group. So we can specify a group of radius servers within Cisco's configuration. So rather than specifying a single radius server and then like having to do multiple radius servers, we just, we create a radius group and we put servers under it. So server one's IP address, server two, server three. And then that group really is what's met, referenced by that method. So it'll actually go through all of those servers in a group before it decides that, okay, this didn't work. So that gives us our redundancy. And at that point, the only thing that can really cause all of them to go down, I mean, it's definitely still possible is if the network is down, right? Like again, think about that branch router that's whose WAN link went down. So that would be a, that would be a situation. Okay. <clears throat> so let's, um, let's go configure it. I think, I think that's about it. I'll flip back to router one here. So I've got router one and router two. And if we're looking at router one here, let's clear that out. Um, I should be able to, let me make sure I can ping router two, 10.10.12.2. I made it. See if router two, okay, good. Router two is awake. And I'm, I've, I, I've been mentally preparing myself for this because when I switch windows on my screen, it does not switch what you're seeing here. 
And so <laughs> I need to um, I need to make sure that when I start punching stuff in on router two, for example, that I, I flip you over. So I'm going to do my absolute best to keep up with that. So let's have some fun with router two's authentication. So if I were to do a quick show run, <clears throat> And we'll look at this down here. Okay, <clears throat> so this line VTY zero to four. We have the option. This is kind of stepping through history a little bit here because tri AAA, this concept of AAA configuration has not been around forever. And so what we started with was the ability to create login prompts and login passwords on the line itself. So this, uh, this VTY is simply saying that Oh, well, let me, let, let me just back up for a moment for those who don't know. So a VTY line is essentially a circuit or a connection being made that would be either Telnet or SSH. So saying zero to four like this means that I've got five different connections, zero, one, two, three, and four. Technically, I can apply different configurations to all of those different lines. And whenever I connect, whenever somebody connects to um, that particular line, they're going to have to do whatever is configured on that specific line. And for better or worse, that's going to be largely random, depending on who else is logged in before me. So um, <clears throat> what we uh, what we need to do is, or what we ideally will do is configure all of these uh, lines to be the same. So let's see here. So let's do config, t actually, let me just do this. So we've got this login command right here. Let's see if I can log into this router. So we'll flip back to router one and I could say telnet, but I can skip the word telnet and say 10.10.12.2 just by punching in the IP address and hitting enter. It'll attempt to uh, telnet in. And you see what we got here is that password is required because we say login, you, you can log in, um, but none has been set. So if we go back to router two, we see that, oh yeah, I don't I don't actually have a password configured here. So let me go do that. Do config T line VTY, and we do it exactly how it's spelled out there, zero space four, and hit enter. And then I, let me, let's just look at some options here. If I do login, I could do a login local. All right, so let's try that. Let's do login local. And do I have any local usernames and passwords? Hmm. Nope, I don't. So let's create one. Actually, let's go back to router one first. Yeah, you gotta break things, right? Let's try connecting, let's see what happens. All right, so it's asking me for username and password now. That's great. Um, there is no username and password configured, so I'm pretty well stuck here. Um, admin, admin, yeah, no? All right, so that's not gonna work. Uh, control shift six, X, all right, very good. Uh, wait, no, that's right, that's not, no, Never mind. You don't want to do that. If you hold control shift pre and, and six, you push all three at once, then you release them all and hit X. It'll cancel your, your telnet session, but as soon as you hit enter, it'll go back into it. And again, at this point, I'm just trying to get out of the fact that it's asking me for a username and password. So let's just keep going. It should kick me out here after a few tries. Boom. All right, killed. You can back out and kill the telnet session. I guess I, I could have done that. I'm on router one, right? Okay, good. Whew. <laughs> I'm going to forget one of these times. All right. So we're on router two now and we've had some fun, but let's go ahead and configure username, admin, secret, because that's what we said we'd do. Admin. All right. Back to router one. Now let's try it. Connecting, admin, admin. We're in. All right. Very, very good. Um, I don't Oh. <laughs> there we go. We found the new, we found the next problem. So at this point, even though I'm in, I can't do anything because there's no, there's no enable pat, uh, set. So, um, yeah, that's, that's not going to work. So let's go ahead and log out of that. And we'll come back to router two and get an enable secret made. We'll make our enable secret Cisco. Now back to router one, telling that in admin whoops oh rats fat fingered it you have to try again admin admin enable cisco all right now we're in now we're in now we're on router two 
So let's back out of this, take a look at our other terminal here. And let's let's see let's see what else we can do. So if I say um, line vty04 and I just say log in. Okay. Notice what it just said. It just told me that I need to set a password. And this is the problem we had earlier. Remember we tried to log in and it required a password but there was none set. So let's go ahead and do password. I don't believe that there is an option for holy cow there's a lot of commands you can run on the VTYs. I didn't think it would be that much. Do, 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 do. I, uh, there's there's no secret option. Um, there's password, and I do believe that that is the limitation of the of the line passwords. So we're gonna have to do a straight up password here, and we'll do um, admin as the password. So now let's flip over to router one, tell that back in. Now it's gonna let us try to enter the password. So I said it was admin. Boom, we're in. Done. All right. Whew, that's uh, that was a little bit, but we haven't even gotten to AAA yet. All right, uh, stub toe username x secret x will set a login uh, in one command. Yes, yes. In fact, it, it it's only one command. Um, you can't do it as separate commands. So that'll give a a local database, but then we have to tell the router to use the local database. So for example, with router two here. When we did a uh, do show run, let me do a section VTY, it should show us just the VTY section. Um, when this was login dash local, um, like this, login dash local, wait, was it space? Yes, space, sorry. Login space local, when it was like this, then it's checking the local username and password. Otherwise, if I just do login, it's going to rely on whatever that line password is. All right. So I wanted to demonstrate that because that whole thing goes away when we enable AAA new model. Okay, if we if we worked in that's what we're gonna do right now, we're on router two, right? Okay. So we're in global configuration and we're gonna say AAA space new dash model. Before I do that, by the way, if I do AAA question mark, that's my only option. It's, it says enable new. Okay, this is like 15 years ago, no joke. So <laughs> new. Um, access control commands and functions. It disables the old commands. It even tells you that right there. So AAA new dash model. And now let's do a show run on that VTY section. See what it gives us. Notice up here just a moment ago, I had login configured. Um, I don't think I hit enter on login local. Nope, so login was still configured and now it's gone. It did keep that password there, and that's because AAA new model can actually reference that password. Um, but the, yeah, I mean, it actually disabled it. If I get onto there, line VTY zero to four, and I say, let's do some uh, login command here. Login, oh, that's different. I can't just hit login anymore. I can't do login local. These are some AAA commands here. Login authentication, We're talking about authentication lists. Remember we talked about applying specific authentication processes to specific, um, you know, I guess interfaces call it, but lines, the circuits and such. So we've enabled new trip, AAA new model. That's good. Um, what are we gonna do next? Well, let's go actually configure some things. So we're gonna do, remember that command that I, um, I wrote out on the blackboard. So we've got AAA authentication let, let's do some question marks here. Let's see what we got. So login is the one we've talked about. Um, PPP, this is where we could actually, remember we did that WAN section a few weeks ago. Um, we could use that when we're doing um, point to point protocol conf configuration. Uh, uh, banner messages, we could actually apply banner messages in here. Dot one X would be an authentication protocol. Um, the enable password, um, just, just a lot of different options in here. So, Let's go ahead and do the login because that's primarily what we're going to do. And again, this is where I can create my own list or I can just do the default list that everything will use. So we're going to say default tonight. Whew. And so we've got that out of the way. Now, this is where we get to do those, those options. So the primary ones we talked about were, um, well, actually I didn't even mention enable. I forgot about that one. So you can actually use the enable password um, as an option. So a group, if we have a server group, that would be um, that would be the radius or the tack x that we have to configure. And we can demonstrate that still too, even though we don't have servers available. Um, 
a line. So that would be the line password. So remember up here, I'm gonna scroll up a little bit. And right here, it actually remembered that I had that password on there, and that's why. Because I can actually reference that password if I want people to log in using it. Not a recommendation by any stretch, but it's an option. This is where we talked about local and local case. Also none, not a good idea, but we could say none. So let's just go through some of these. Um, let's try enable. And now we'll flip back to router one and we'll try to log in. And it's asking for a password. Well, this should be the enable password. And I think I made the enable password admin, didn't I? Or did I make it Cisco? Cisco? I made it Cisco, there we go. <laughs> so Cisco got me in and then enable Cisco. So there we go. I, I logged in using the enable because that's what I told it to do. So let's exit out of this, flip back over to router two. I guess I could do the router two configuration while I'm on router two, but that might get complicated. So let's change this now to say, uh, let's do the line password. Okay, what was that line password? What did I make it? That's the admin, right? Yes, that's admin. So flip back over to router one. Now we're connecting and I say, admin and there we go i got in that is what it's asking me to do or i'm entering i have to enter the password that it's expecting and in that case that was the local line now again keep in mind if i were to create a different password on different lines then i'm just gonna have to guess as to which line i'm on so don't don't do that <laughs> maybe in a lab environment thanks big papa yeah he's helping me out reminding me of uh, what i uh <laughs> what passwords i set i'm glad someone's paying attention that's good um, all right, so next is, well, you know, let's just try none. That should be fun. So now we're gonna come back here and we're gonna connect. It just let me in. It didn't even ask for anything. Isn't that great? <laughs> that, is not, that is not recommended. Do not do that. So um, yeah, yeah, we're just gonna say don't do that. So, so exit out of there um, back here. So let's go ahead and, ex oh, I guess we could do the local as well. Um, but let's do that as part of this. Uh, quick question by Mr. Liddall. When entering in the IP address, you don't have to put Telnet in the beginning. You do not have to put Telnet in. Um, that's a great thing about little shortcuts here and there. So yeah, no, you can skip the word Telnet. Good point. Um, if you're doing SSH, by the way, which is what you should be doing in your environment, do not have Telnet. Telnet should not be enabled. Um, we should we should be SSH everywhere, but um, shame on me I didn't set up SSH on this. So um, in your networks you should absolutely have SSH enabled, and that at that point you have to type in SSH. So that's that's life. All right, so let's go ahead and configure this like we have some radius servers. So we're going to say triple A, and we're going to create a group. Should be right in there. Yep, server, and which type do we want to configure? Oh, sorry, Mr. Liddell. If there was a test sim, would it be best to put Telnet in first? 100%. Yeah. Anytime you're using a simulator, sim, I said that wrong. Anytime you're using a simulator <laughs> um, instead of real equipment, then 100%, like, don't take any shortcuts. Type everything. I wouldn't even, I would, I would consider typing in configure terminal or config terminal, right? Like, you just, just be aware of it. Like, there might be a time where you say CONF space T and you hit enter and it doesn't work. Rather than freaking out, be like, okay, I'm on a simulator. Um, it's probably expecting more, so I'm going to try config T instead of conf T, um, and you know those kinds of things. So don't don't flip out. Oh, Big Papa wants uh, TACX. All right, all right, we'll do TACX then. <laughs> Completely irrelevant decision, but I appreciate it. Um, server group name. What are we gonna call this? Uh, we'll call it um, CCNA. Why not have some fun? All right, so now we're in this group. Now we get to configure the actual server IPs. So I believe it's uh, server, yep, server, and then what is the IP address? Though so we're gonna make something up here. 10.1.1.1, hit enter, and let's just say server 10.1.1.2. I don't know. So we're, we're configuring a couple of servers here. I'm not exactly sure what that message is. I'm not used to seeing that. Server is not defined. Did I do something wrong there? Server host name or IP address. I did the ho IP address. Huh. Oh, 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 I know. Yep, I did skip. I, I skipped a, uh, I did skip a key 
part. What is, yeah, TACAC server. There we go. So um, you actually have to specify these before you configure that. I forgot about that. That's why I'm not used to seeing that message. So I skipped a step. First of all, I'm on the right one, right? Okay, good. First of all, we have to define the servers. Then we create the group and we specify the um, the servers inside the group. So I did skip that part. So let's come in here. TACAC server 10.1.1.1 is what I had said. Um, oops, I forgot the word host. Host. Is this right? Yep, good. 10.1.1.1. And then whatever our key is, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, something like that. We can, uh, that, that's usually all we need. Um, if you have a different port, you'd want to specify that here. Um, and then the other one I said was 10.1.1.2, I believe. So there we go. So that first step. First step, and if you're doing radius, it should just be radius server. Yeah. So either way, TACX or radius, we define the server. Then we go into the group. So let's do that. Um, where were we before? Oh, you were defining the AAA group. AAA group, um, TACX, AAA group, server, TACX, and then CCNA. And technically, I don't, I don't actually have to do this because I already technically did it, but server 10.1.1.1, server 10.1.1.2, now I'm not getting barked at, exit, okay. So I've created my group called CCNA. I've added the servers that I, are, that I defined outside of the AAA configuration. Now let's go back to AAA authentication, um, login default, and now for my options, okay? So this is where I specify the group. I'd say group, and then it's a TACX. Oh, whoops. This is where I can specify an individual TACX server if I want. Um, well, it'll, yeah, um, it'll, it'll use its, it'll just kind of go through all of them, or I can specify my own group, which is CCNA. But notice again, I can keep adding methods here. I don't have to stop. Uh, stub toe, this will work in conjunction with a TACX server to authenticate a login. Yes, exactly. One of those two IP addresses I specified, every time I log into router two, it's going to go out and try to find that. Okay. And if it can't find it, then it's going to use one of its backups methodologies. But again, keep in mind, I'll say it again, just to make sure everybody heard. When you're taking a Cisco exam, chances are they'll ask at some point, or just understand that this is totally within the realm of possibility, that they might say the TACX server responds with a, with a rejection message. So you look at this command and it's got login default group CCNA followed by um, enable or local, let's just do local in this case, local. So this is your command. What happens if this part fails? Well, it didn't fail. It actually succeeded. It said, no, that's not a good, that's not a good username and password. And if that's the case, then it's going to reject my login um, request. Only if it doesn't get a response, we'll go to the backup method, in this case, accessing the local database. Um, and I believe I made it admin admin. So let's go try that. So we're gonna go back to router one. We're gonna try to log in. And because, I mean, at this point, it's already no, like it, it hasn't gotten in touch with that server, with the TACAC server. And so it's it's asking for a username and password, but it's asking for the local database. So we'll say admin, admin, hopefully that's what I did. And there we go, I'm in. So even though I configured it for TACAX, I was able to get in using the local database because that's, that was the backup method. And my TACAC servers are all down because I don't have TACAC servers. All right, very good. So it's 9.03, um, we need to get into the automation piece, but um, any thoughts or questions on AAA, be sure to let me know. Otherwise, uh, well, again, we, we primarily played with the um, AAA authentication, just really quick. AAA has also authorization commands. So here's where we would define um, permissions for our users. And so you're going to want to explore this. Um, a lot of times we use exec here um, for you know our authentication commands. But just when you're when you're going through this process, when you're going through your CCNA studies, um, understand that that's how we that's how we do that. Um, accounting is right here. This is this is a little more straightforward. Um, we just uh, we yeah we're sending uh, our accounts to a AAA server. 
So that's that's all that that's going to be. So um, yeah, I think that's it. So let's go ahead and go back to our whiteboard because that will be all we're doing. If I can find my whiteboard, there we go. That would be all we're doing on the routers tonight. So let's clear this. Give me a new color. Pink, purple, let's do pink. Hot pink. Okay, so in fact, time out for a moment. Let's go take a look at um, what Cisco wants us to learn. So here's infrastructure maintenance 5.0. Incidentally, they are adding these kinds of sections to almost every exam. So this is going to be, this is, keep in mind, this is the old CCNA. We're still helping you try to pass this by February. And if you don't, hey, I guarantee you that AAA is on the new CCNA as well, so you're not wasting your time. But I do expect, without having it in front of me, that the programmability section is going to be more robust on the new CCNA. That said, they want us to know three specific things. We're going to cover all of those here in, in quick succession. The function of a controller, the separation of control and data plane, northbound and southbound APIs. Okay? So that's all they want us to know. Let's dive into that. If I can find my whiteboard. There we go. Okay, so let's just write those down real quick so I remember them and don't forget. Controller, um, control and data plane, and then the um, north and southbound APIs. Okay, so first of all, this concept of a controller. So we're talking, when we're talking about automation, we're talking about this newfangled, you probably heard this phrase, software defined networking, okay, SDN. Software defined networking is a, call it a new trend. It's been around for, in various forms for probably the better part of the 2010s. I mean, um, I think 2012 was when it kind of became a thing people were talking about. And it has greatly evolved throughout the decade. Okay, what it was, what the promise was, the promise of SDN, I'll just kind of give you the 30 second version of this, was that I could have a Cisco router here and a Juniper router here and a Dell switch here, and I could have a controller. So this is our first concept. I could have a network controller, if I can spell controller. Yeah, I'll just use the E as an L, there we go. My E's and my L's are very similar apparently. So the controller to control these devices. And I am a user now, and instead of logging into all of these individual devices to manage them, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm logging into the controller. And SDN really goes beyond just like a controller. You think about Meraki. I don't know how, how many of you have used Meraki equipment, but Meraki is kind of this way, right? I mean, it's I've got I've got switches out there. Um, I've got access points. I've got routers, um, layer three switches at least. I don't know if they have routers. Um, and I mean, hey, they even they even came out with a phone system a while ago. I think they pulled it from the market though, so I don't think it did well. <laughs> they do have firewalls though, and and I can configure all of these devices through a GUI interface, through a graphical user interface, usually connected over uh, like an HTML and a web browser. And that's great and all, except it, it's the SDN vision goes beyond that. The SDN vision, uh, there's a few things going on here that that. SDN really encompasses. First of all, it's the idea of getting away from the nitty gritty configurations. Okay, I shouldn't have to tell, this is the theory of SDN, this is not me telling you this. <laughs> I shouldn't have to tell a router to run OSPF. I shouldn't have to tell a, route, a, a switch to configure spanning tree. These devices should just figure out where they are in the network and do it. Isn't that the dream, right? And, and in the 2012, 2013 timeframe, this was like, this is, this is a nightmare. We're all gonna lose our jobs. The robots are coming. And also um, this is going to doom Cisco. Cisco's not gonna be relevant by 2020. How'd that work out? And uh, the reason that they said it's not going to be relevant is because if I don't con configure things anymore, if the computers are doing all the configuration, then who cares if it's a Cisco router or a Juniper router or an Arista router? Who cares if it's a Cisco switch or a Dell switch? In fact, SDN was a limiting factor because if Cisco could configure EIGRP on its router, as an example here, we've got a feature called the EIGRP. It's on a Cisco router. 
do you think an open source controller or do you think a controller made by a, any other company is going to run EIGRP? No, it can only run OSPF. So we're not able to use the features and functionality that Cisco brings to the table because we're limited by this controller. This was, this was again, this is theoretical 20, early 2010s um, SDN. And so um, if I have a, a controller that's limiting, then I'm going to go with the cheapest hardware I can get. As long as it is fully capable within the realm of this, you know, like if I get this router and it's so bad that it doesn't support OSPF, obviously that's no good. But for the most part, the open standards were being written so that these were really dumbed down. Like, you know, we can't do some fancy things that Cisco has been doing for a long time. And so again, the theory was, this is the future. Everybody's going to buy an SDN controller. Everybody's going to rip out their Cisco hardware and put in cheap Dell stuff or whatever is out there. And, you know, honestly, it wasn't even Dell or HP or anything. They, they predicted the death of all of these companies making routing and switching equipment. They felt like the, the industry felt like white box switching was going to be where it was at. Because now I can just go buy a white box switch from Facebook, which I can do. I can go buy a switch from Facebook. I've got to put my own software on it. Um, so I wouldn't recommend going out and doing that. But hey, if this controller is the software and this is a Facebook white box switch, then I'm good. I'm good. It'll push it. It'll push some open source software out there, and I'll be, I'll be swimming in free, cheap, easy networking. Right. That was, that was the goal of SDN. Now, that was the dream. Well, life doesn't really work out like you expect, um, or at least like the industry expects. And even though a lot of these elements remain, okay, to be fair, a lot of these elements have remained. But what really has happened across the industry is that Cisco has their SDN controller, and HP has their own SDN controller, and Arista has their own, and everybody kind of has their own way of doing this. It didn't, it didn't devolve into... I'm going to go buy a third party um, controller and I'm going to have it manage Cisco devices. Or I'm going to have it, have it manage HP, Dell, Arista devices. It didn't really work out that way. And part of that is because, go figure, if Cisco's making a controller and it's going to control Cisco devices, which are super, have so many features, um, so many awesome features, well, their controller can leverage those features. And to be fair, not, not to put on too much of a Cisco bias, HP has their secret sauce. They have their things they like, and their controllers can do that too. Arista does the same way. Um, and so as we've developed these, um, that, that that's how kind of the industry has gone back to this, hey, you know what? If you want to go with an SDN solution, you kind of pick your vendor and you go with it still. So it didn't create this, you know, uh, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is, but this this awesome networking environment where I can buy literally whatever piece of hardware I want. That was what the SDN dream was. Like, go buy a Dell router one day because it's the cheapest, and then HP's cheaper the next day. So go buy an HP router. You just have whatever whatever hardware you want in your environment. It doesn't matter anymore. I mean, that's the SDN dream. But we were far from that, and I don't think it'll ever get there, frankly. The other concern that happened is that SDN started in, in the data center. And I don't know how much you all have experience with data centers, but data center infrastructures are pretty cut and dry, like um, pretty cookie cutter, call it. So in a, in a data center, you either have a pair of aggregation switches. Uh, you can't read that at all. A pair of aggregation switches going to some number of access switches like this. That's one option within within the data center. And then you have the three tier model. So your core is upstream or you have what's called a spine leaf where your core comes in to a leaf switch. Here's my leaf switches. Looks like access switches. I get that. And then we've usually got smaller spine switches. And this looks very similar. Whoops. It's missing the line. There we go. I think that's good. My But everything comes in via the, the leaf switches. So it's very different. Uh, if you have a CBT Nuggets subscription, we've got a lot of videos. Jeremy Char is part of the new CCNA. He goes through a lot of network topologies. So check out those videos if you haven't. He actually talks about Spineleaf. If you really want to know about Spineleaf, go check out some of my content on ACI because um, we really drill into Spineleaf. Uh, Spineleaf is a lot of fun. But either way, 
Regardless, it's time to change color. Pink's getting old. Either way, between these two topologies, they really look just like that. And they're really, really predictable. We don't have to worry about stuff. What kind of stuff do I mean? Well, chart out a network, a normal network. Let's say I've got a network core here, a pair of switches. Um, and okay, well now I've got a, a pair of routers down here. So, okay, this is pretty predictable. A pair of routers that are going out to ver you know WAN circuits. So now I've got a WAN circuit out to one site. I've got a WAN circuit out to another site. I've got a WAN circuit out to a third site. Um, now I've got a distribution layer over here. I've got a distribution layer over here. I've got access switches out here. I've got chassis access switches at one site. I've got stackable switches at another. The, the non-data center world is, it, it, it's a mess. It could be anything. I mean, I, I can hang routers off of router. I could have another router hanging off of this router for whatever reason, right? I mean, that's that's totally legit. That that happens. And our route, I mean, our network protocols are designed to handle this, but it's very, very unpredictable. We can't just know what a network topology looks like. This is one reason why these SDN controllers have taken so long to develop outside of the data center space. Incidentally, inside the data center space, there's primarily only two solutions available. Um, Cisco ACI and VMware NSX are the two biggest SDN platforms out there. There are others, don't get me wrong. OpenStack would be the open source version, but even OpenStack has really been on the decline as far as my personal experience and understanding is concerned. So there's not, I mean, there's there's just not a lot of momentum to, to push this to, back towards the vision that it was supposed to be. Instead, what we have is Cisco working on a solution. It's called DNA, well, um, the Digital Network Architecture DNA Center. But general, generically speaking, what they call it is software-defined access, SD access. Maybe you've seen that. Software-defined access is, um, is, is outside of the data center, okay? If you ever heard of APIC EM, which is, you know, I guess is application policy infrastructure controller dash enterprise module, believe it or not, but APIC dash EM. Um, that was a software package that Cisco was developing to be the controller. And then they wrapped that up into DNA center. Um, all right, Mr. Ludal is, is SDN in the data center than this idea of SD WAN? No, believe it or not, SD WAN is a whole other entity, which fortunately Cisco doesn't have on the blueprint. So we don't need to worry about it, at least for this CCNA, if you're working on, on that. Um, SD-WAN, there's no really great way of covering that in the amount of time that we have here. It's a great question, but I will say this, it covers this area down here, okay? The goal is to very intelligently switch traffic between multiple LAN, WAN links and, and send important traffic across stable WAN links, send less important traffic across high bandwidth links because those are cheaper and it won't disrupt the important stuff. And by the way, when WAN circuits start having problems to dynamically start flipping those over. Okay. SD-WAN is kind of its own little world, but it is a software package that is looking dynamically at your network situation and intelligently moving traffic around. All right. So like maybe I was sending traffic that out that WAN link a moment ago but that WAN link is now having all kinds of jitter and delay problems. So I'm going to move at least the voice traffic to a different, more stable line. Um, Big Papa, you had a question on APIC EM on a practice exam. Okay, well, thank you for telling me that. Um, obviously a practice exam wants to cover a lot and um, the old CCNA, if you're gonna try to take that exam before February, probably is not going to reference DNA Center. It would probably reference APIC EM. So I'm glad you told me that. So we all are aware of what APIC EM is. APIC EM is this concept of a software defined networking controller. It is Cisco's SDN controller. And Cisco's SDN controller is designed to work with all of its own equipment. Now, the one thing the, um, the Cisco APIC EM, what APIC EM doesn't work with is this over here. We talked about it, Cisco ACI. Cisco ACI, has its own controller, which you should probably know, but fortunately it's easy to remember. ACI's controller is called APIC. 
the way they got APIC EM is by taking Cisco's first SDN solution, ACI, Application Centric Infrastructure. It's alphabet soup tonight, so sorry about that. But Application Centric Infrastructure was Cisco's first SDN solution. It went into the data center. Its controller was called the Application Policy Infrastructure Controller, or APIC. Then Cisco said, hey, that's great. Let's do it in the enterprise. And they developed a completely separate software package. It looks nothing alike. It was built completely differently. And the only similarity is that they decided just to make it easy to understand because yeah, that always is a great idea. Um, to, we're gonna name it the same thing, except we're gonna tack on enterprise module because it goes into the enterprise space, not into the data center space, okay? So long story short on this, and we'll move on to the control and data plane concept here in a moment. Long story short on this, there is a controller that is going to, in some way, control the network. It's how you configure the network now. You log into this controller and it's more than Meraki. So Meraki is management only, that's good. Let's talk a little bit about control and data planes because this is going to tell us how it's different now. So within the SDN world, when we have our controller now, have our controller. I, I, I always wanna spell controller without that second L. There we go. All right, so controller is out here. And w within the CC, if you're a CCNA candidate ready to go take the CCNA, you should probably understand the difference between a control plane and the data plane. Okay, the control plane sits up here. We'll just call this CP, control plane. The control plane is sitting here making decisions, okay? We're making the decisions. The control plane is usually known for things like OSPF, EIGRP, spanning tree protocol at layer two. All right, we're, we're talking to other network devices and making decisions. And that's great and all, we've got all this information, but what do we do with that information? Well, now we're going to hand it down, maybe even like call it, maybe try to make it a little three-dimensional here. Now we're gonna put it down into the data plane. This plus and X thing is just my thing. Don't, don't think this is anything official. I'm just trying to differentiate between the two. So now this data plane, this is not talking to anybody. Forget it. I am making my decisions based on what I know. What do I know? Well, this is things like, or this would include things like the IP routing table and maybe the MAC address table. Okay. Uh, multicast. Uh, PIM adjacencies, you know, all these things like th this, the decisions are being, have, has decision at this point has already been made. So when I get a packet in, coming in, I'm going to check my IP routing table, ARP table would be another one, right? I'm gonna check all of these device, or all of these tables, all of my data points. I'm gonna make a decision and I'm going to send it out according to that information. Now, where does that information come from? Well, the information comes right here. The control plane feeds the data plane. It feeds the information to the data plane and the data plane makes the decisions and pushes it along that way, all right? We understand this somewhat intuitively because if you can, if you go out and configure EIGRP, that EIGRP, you're, you're gonna have an EIGRP topology table and that's good. That's up here in the control plane, right? The EIGRP topology table. But at some point that, that EIGRP configuration gives me routes in my routing table. And that route, the routes in my routing table are what decide where packets go, all right? The router doesn't go back to EIGRP and say, hey, where should I send this, all right? EIGRP doesn't care at that point. EIGRP has already populated the routing table with everything it knows. Therefore, um, the, routing, uh, the, the data plane already has everything that it, it's going to get, okay? So if, if I don't have a route somewhere, I'm just gonna drop the packet. I don't have to go ask anybody anything, all right? So the control plane feeds the data plane. Hopefully that, that makes sense. Bug Papa House says the control plane is where we work. I mean, kind of, you're right. I don't, well, I know I would, I'd actually argue against that. I mean, if you, anytime you go in there and you configure a static route, you're, you're playing control plane, right? <laughs> or I'm sorry, you're playing, you're playing data plane. I said that wrong. Um, you're actually making decisions for the data plane at that point. 
So, I mean, you could say that you're the control plane. I don't know. It gets a little complicated, I suppose. So, within SDN, there is this concept of control and data plane separation. What that means is that my control plane no longer, let me change to red because now it's bad. My control plane no longer makes all of those decisions. What happens is that the controller is smart enough to see everything that the routers are seeing. So we're sending all of that like EIGRP information, uh, spanning tree information. We're sending all of that to the controller. And believe it or not, the controller is going to send that down to the data plane. I didn't draw the data plane over here, but there it is, data plane, now it's red. So the controller is the control plane. Anything that happens, um, or all, any decision that needs to be made is made by the controllers. Anybody see any flaw with this, by the way? I'll take a drink so you have time to think. It's not a flaw with if it's all working great. We got five minutes here, so we're gonna wrap up. The, the problem, the potential problem is what happens if this controller goes down? If that controller goes down, um, there better not be any changes in the entire network, <laughs> okay? Yeah, Big Papa, you got it. Lose contact with the controller. Um, that's the problem. That's a huge problem. Um, this controller is in band now. Uh, believe it or not, there is a big fancy word for this model. It's called an imperative model. An imperative... And just call it imperative model, but an SDN model, imperative SDN model. Okay. Um, this is going back to, again, the academics and the people who talked about SDN as being this huge takeover. This is, this is their design. Okay. Because you know, again, why would they design it this way? Well, the reason they design it this way is because they want as dumb of devices out there as possible. They, they want like terminals, like just, just hardware that can run whatever the controller tells it to run. And so if I just put data plane only devices out on my network, well, that makes it cheaper. Now, Cisco looked at this and said, okay, this is, this is fine. Um, but we're more interested in what we call, uh, change that. There we go. What we call a declarative SDN model, the declarative SDN model says, okay, we have very smart routers and switches out there. They've got valid control planes. At this point, if we were to use the controller in an imperative model, we'd just be shutting down the control plane part of our routers and switches and letting the controller do everything. So instead, Cisco's vision for this with the DNA center and with ACI is to allow the routers to keep their control planes intact and to really be more of a management solution. Now that's dumbing it down. That's not a fair way of saying it because it's way more than management. It's doing a lot of intelligence as far as it, like it'll, it'll insert itself into the control plane, make no mistake if it needs to. Um, but it's pri primarily an orchestrator, right? You all are smart. You've all got valid control planes. I, I trust your decisions. Um, but you just need to know this. You need to understand that. So that when I, as a user, here I am logging in with my laptop, one of the worst drawn laptops I've ever done. There we go. Well, anyways, I don't know why I'm critiquing my laptop drawing. When I tell it, hey, this is what I want. I'm creating policy. This declarative model pushes that policy into the routers. Okay, it's not that it doesn't do configuration, right? It definitely will do configuration, but it's still trusting the network to figure out how best to implement that. Okay. This is, I understand, this is very high level. Don't don't stress about the details. I know like my brain is like immediately, let the network figure it out. What does that mean? For CCNA, we don't need to worry about it, okay? We don't, I don't even, to be fair, I don't know if the CCNA will ask about imperative versus declarative models. I can tell you that Cisco data center exams ask about that a lot because Cisco sees this as a big um, uh, differentiation is the word I was looking for a big differentiation from other products on the market as far as Cisco's are, are concerned, because if it's controllers go down for any reason, I get it. A controller going down is, is a very rare situation ideally, but if it does go down, that works fine. If, if, if a link goes down, OSPF can figure out how to work around that link, even though the controller is down. 
You can't make management changes. I can't go in there and change my policy without access to the controller, but at least the network doesn't die a fiery death if the controller disappears. All right. Um, Big Papa House. So the control plane. Oh, wait. No, I'm sorry. Stub toe. Wait. No, okay. I'm behind on a few things. Um, control plane's order to lose contract with the controller. Okay. Mr. Ladal, if a controller drops, wouldn't the router still route under the current configs? Yes, they would. So so a key thing that I met. Um, I, I tried to throw it in there is if there's a change in the network, then we're toast, right? Because if a if you have two routers, and let's say I've got a third router actually, let's say I've got three routers, and I'm sending my IP routing table says to send traffic this way, and this link goes down, that that router is smart enough to figure out to send the traffic that way instead, right? Well, if we have nothing, if the controller goes down and potentially goes down because there's a network event and there's a bunch of changes that are made, well, um, then we're toast because the routing table will never get updated. It'll keep trying to send out the link that's down. So it'll just drop that traffic. Um, yeah, and large networks, there are little changes happening all over the place. So we gotta be careful about that. All right, now stub toe, maybe needed changes couldn't, maybe needed changes couldn't be processed. Is that why there's, is, why there's a risk of redundancy? Um, we definitely need redundant controllers for sure. Um, let's see here, big Papa house. So the control plane, whether it's local to the device or on a controller is where the routing processes, et cetera, are running while the data plane sees only the routing table, cam table, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yep. You only see the tables. You're not actually running those processes anymore. Um, dark coder. Hi, welcome. Um, all right. So, um, where are we going? All right, we're out of time, 931. Um, I do have to mention one more thing, and that is the API concept. So we'll throw that out in less than five minutes and we'll be done. So there's this concept of application program, programming, programmatic, however you wanna say it, but usually programming, application programming interface. An API is a way of communicating with usually a system, a software package, et cetera. Um, Think of it like this. If I've got a software package, let's say I have an accounting package, okay? And I, this is software running in my data center or in my environment or what have you. And then I go and I buy a, I don't know, I'm, I'm totally making this up on the fly, so I hope this is valid, <laughs> but I think it is. Let's say I buy a payroll application. And um, I'm, I'm, if I'm doing my job, I, I'm gonna take some information from this accounting package and I'm going to use that to, you know, to, to feed information into the payroll software. And, and I'm sitting here in the middle doing this hard work, let's say. Well, wouldn't it be great if I could feed information back and forth automatically? And I could write an app, maybe I could write code here that's going to do that for me. So, hey, it's still like pulling it down and sending it up on its own. But if these applications have what we call APIs, these are, Think of it like a networking socket, right? We're networking people. It's like a network socket on the soft in the software. And again, it's going to allow me to communicate back and forth between disparate systems, different systems, however you want to say it. So APIs are our way of interfacing with software. All right. These cell phones all day long are using APIs. Because if I want to write, I could get on, I could write, uh, this is an Android phone, and I could write an app that goes in there. It's a flash, I could write a flashlight app and I could make it so that it turns that flashlight on. Well, there's an API within the Android operating system that controls that flashlight. So here's my Android operating system. And here's my flashlight, here's the hardware piece out over here. And I've got an API right here that I can interface with to make that light turn on and off. So Jeff writes his code right here. Here's Jeff's code. And I send this API a signal, call it. I, I send it a command into that API that says, hey, turn that flashlight on or turn that flashlight off. Okay, that's how APIs work. So, that was a very quick overview of APIs. Trust me, um, you'll want to spend a little more time on this. Here's, here's a definition that um, we need to understand 
okay? Um, there's this concept of northbound APIs, northbound, I would say north, and we have southbound APIs, okay? So when we have a network controller, one of the promises of SDN is that we can have, um, let's see, SDN controller is what I was gonna write. One of the promises of SDN is that I can use software to control the network. Um, I could write my own software to control the network. And so the idea here is that the southbound APIs are what are facing the network devices, whatever is going on there. Um, this is how it controls the network. It's no longer, remember we mentioned SNMP, by the way? SNMP is dead in an SDN world. We do not use SNMP, we use these APIs instead. The APIs are very standards driven, very simple to access. Um, and again, we don't have time to go into how they're accessed and I don't think Cisco really wants us to know that. But the northbound APIs would be how we communicate into this controller from our own applications. So if we wanna write an application, we would um, write it such that we're interfacing with northbound APIs on the SDN controller, right? This would be an API right here that says, hey, um, I don't know, after 10 p.m., I want you to, I write an application that, that after 10 p.m., this is a horrible idea, after 10 p.m. at night, we're going to turn the network off. <laughs> that would not be probably the best idea. But hey, this application then goes and sends the signal to the API using the using that application programming interface on the SDN controller to say, hey, shut her down. And then the SDN controller uses its southbound APIs to communicate back and forth with these routers and ensure that the network turns off, whatever that means, okay? So northbound and southbound, just go out there and make sure that you read and understand that. Um, because it is literally on the blueprint. I mean, that is that is what Cisco says right here is we need to understand, whoops, there we go, northbound and southbound APIs. So make sure you study that, make sure you know which one is a northbound, which one's a southbound API, and hopefully you should be good to go there. All right, so let's check in on the chat before we uh, cut it off. So, all right, dark coder, I work with APIs. Um, good, yeah, well, you're, you're a coder um, <laughs> for your name, so good. I would imagine you do work with APIs. Gifted Lane, favoriting right now. All right, very good. Thanks for joining us, by the way. Uh, Big Papa House, well, a Cisco router has a valid control plane, so instead of shutting down the control plane on the router and replacing it with a controller, just have the controller monitoring the feedback and adjust the information. Yes, absolutely. Panda, when is the next DevNet stream? Um, all right, so yes, for those not aware, I am um, doing Mondays and Wednesdays, so that would be tomorrow is the next one, at 3 p.m. Eastern, it's much earlier in the day, so it's really good for our European friends too. I know 8 p.m. Um, Eastern time is 1 a.m. in uh, Western Europe, so that's not ideal either for them. So 3 p.m. Eastern um, makes it a little bit better for a lot of people. That is a, um, a time when I am literally learning. I'm not teaching, like, I mean, I, I, I toss my thoughts out there, but I'm pulling up CBT Nuggets con content, um, watching it live. I'm taking my notes. I'm making comments. I'm, um, <laughs> I'm just there to learn and I'm inviting you to come and learn along with me. I figure if I'm going to learn this, maybe you want to learn it too. So you can always catch up on those by going, you know, here in my channel, taking a look at the videos link above. You can catch up on anything that you may have missed from the last, we've done three sessions now. Um, you know, the uh, we, we've covered some of the basics of automation, DevNet stuff. Um, I got my computer set up <laughs> with, with some coding packages. We just learned Yang yesterday. I'm gonna say, you can go back and watch that. If you wanna see me get confused, you'll, you'll enjoy that video because I got really confused. Um, still am a little confused, but I think I'm in a better place now. And so tomorrow, um, I'm blanking on what we're covering tomorrow. Uh, it's whatever's next in the list. I believe it's, um, I believe we're actually gonna do some Python scripting. I have to take a look at it. Um, but either way, we're at, the, the point is simply, we're watching live, actual, real CBT Nuggets content. So if you wanna come, tune in, watch it with me and learn with me, um, please do it. So that'll be tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern on Wednesday. And that's the schedule right now. Monday's at 3 p.m. DevNet, Tuesday's at 8 p.m. CCNA. Wednesdays at 3 p.m. we're doing DevNet again. So 
come along, um, hang out, and uh, hopefully you everybody gets to uh, learn something with me. All right. Um, anything else in the chat, Big Papa? Found you. Oh, wish you found you in my channel earlier. Yeah. So all of these. First of all, well, actually, so Twitch stores all of these videos for 60 days. So you can always watch them here on Twitch. However, I do have a YouTube channel that I'm exporting all of these CCNA videos to the to YouTube. So um, the DevNet stuff will only be on Twitch. It's uh, kind of intentionally it's going to expire in 60 days because it actually has real C CBD Nuggets content. So that'll be expiring after 60 days. But all CCNA content is on my YouTube channel. Um, it'll be here on the end screen, but it's simply youtube.com slash kish squared. Um, kish squared is a, a tag of mine, a video game tag that I've had for a long time. I already had YouTube and Twitch channels and everything like that. And I was like, hey, you know what? We're just going to make this all about networking now. So you can look for look for me there. Um, thanks, Jake. You've just posted the, yeah, we, we've got the YouTube link in the chat now. And you can check out my CBT Nuggets content as well. Um, last thing I'll say is... Just generally speaking, um, yeah, the interactivity is is great. Um, I really appreciate everybody coming out watching these live streams. I also know I can't cover everything um, from a CCNA perspective in the short amount of time that we have together. So especially if you are working towards your CCNA by February 24th, which is the cutoff date for the CCNA version, uh, be sure to check out CBT Nuggets. CBT Nuggets has such phenomenal content um, by not just me, but other trainers as well. And in fact, if you go do CBT Nuggets, you're you're learning from Jeremy Chara, Keith Barker, Chuck Keith, some just really well-known industry names that are uh, they they've developed some great CCNA content out there. So be sure to check out CBT Nuggets. I've got a link down in the channel for CBT Nuggets as well. So with that, thank you very much. I appreciate everybody coming out. Very interactive tonight. I loved that. Um, uh, and so just, yeah, please join us as, when you can. And when you can't, be sure to check out the archive once it's been recorded. With that, everybody have a great night, and we'll see you next time.